Hi, everyone. We're super excited today to be bringing you part two of our webinar series, Living Your Best Garden. Our summer gardens uh, is what we're going to be talking to today. Uh, the Nature Conservancy and The Ohio State University Ag Extension Office have come together to bring you this amazing webinar series. Um, and this is part two. If you missed our spring gardens uh, presentation, feel free to reach out to me and I can make sure that you get a recording um, link to that. But today we're going to focus on all things summer gardens. I know here in Columbus, Ohio, it doesn't quite feel so summery, but I'm looking forward to the abundance. We're going to go ahead and get started here. And I have a quick presentation just because we know that we have both advertised this. We want to give a little bit of information about who the Nature Conservancy is and what we do. So the Nature Conservancy is one of the leading global conservation nonprofits. Our mission is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. Our vision is a world where the diversity of life thrives and people act to conserve nature for its own sake and its ability to fulfill our, need, uh, our needs and enrich our lives. We work in over 79 different countries and territories, over 1 million members, over 70 years of conservation success for 400 scientists, 125 million acres conserved worldwide and over 100 plus marine conservation pro projects. We are science-based, collaborative, and innovative, and we help to make tangible lasting results. The Nature Conservancy all works together towards our 2030 goals that are focused around climate, oceans, lands, and fresh water, and of course, people. We have some ambitious goals, but we all work together locally to help scale up globally and make a really big lasting difference. In the Midwest, we work together on climate action and renewables, Great Lakes fisheries and coastal areas, rivers, floodplains, tributaries, agriculture, northwoods, and of course, prairies, woodlands, and wetlands. We're really excited today to be bringing you this special presentation in webinar series with Dr. Tim McDermott, who's going to be our expert today, helping us to live our best garden life this summer. Go ahead and take it away, Tim. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Angie. I appreciate the invite, and I was I was going through the um, participant list, and I see some extension colleagues, and I've even seen some names of people that I community garden with. So we are going to jump right into it too. And I like to do similar to what Angie did. Uh, I like to introduce my organization to folks who may not know what we are. So I work for Ohio State University Extension. And what Extension is, is we are the outreach arm of the university that satisfies the land grant mission of the university. My mandate is to radiate the knowledge and research of all of Ohio to all Ohioans. Um, and I am a Franklin County educator. So I am in Franklin County, City of Columbus. I right now am in my office on West Campus Waterman Farm, where we have hundreds and hundreds of guests milling around outside because we are one of the locations for the co-size neighborhood-based SciFest. But let's jump right on into it. I'm going to start with a video because, you know, it, it, it has just been absolutely brutally cold in just the last few days. And so this is what my garden looks like now, although I shot this video in COVID world. I was blessed that we were allowed to get out in community garden. We had very similar temperatures, if you remember, back in COVID world. And this, believe it or not, if you look at the trees, they are leafing out. This was also done around May 10th or so then. And so where that really matters is when we think about plants, we have to take into consideration that the seeds and the transplants that we're putting in the ground go in the ground. And so we do monitor air temperature because that affects plants. Plants, but we have to very closely monitor soil temperature. And so we are living our best garden life today, but we're not actually planting our best summer veggies right this minute. Because quite honestly, if you were to put something like a tomato in the ground, this is what would happen to it. I had, um, I was down at the garden the other day and I garden at a um, Wallace Community Gardens, one of three actual remaining victory gardens in the United States. And 
when I was down there, I saw people had planted last week their tomatoes already because we've had some patches of heat. Our soil temperatures right now are colder than where they were at parts of February, believe it or not. So what happens is if you plant your summer veggies into soil that is not correct for them to grow, especially our tomatoes, things like peppers, they are not going to be able to uptake their nutrients. The soil is simply too cold for them. And then they start turning funny colors and then they die. And in fact, I saw in COVID year, we had some warm temperature early in the season before it went to super cold. And I saw um, a friend of mine at my community garden had to replant three times because he would put stuff in and it would die and then put more stuff in and then it would die. And then finally, we were able to get some tomatoes on that. So don't rush it. Monitor your soil temperatures. When I um, want to know mine, this is Columbus Station, Waterman Farm. I can simply go online and find where that is. If you want to know your soil temps at your house, then sneak into your kitchen, reach into your cupboard, grab the kitchen thermometer. Uh, I like the digital ones because they will actually go this low where some of the ones that are like an oven thermometer might be for higher temperatures and then measure it about two inches down and about five inches down because that is the zone that your seeds are going to live and your transplants are going to live and you want it minimum above 50 and for tomatoes and summer stuff you want it closer to 70. I don't rush my stuff and then like we looked at the first webinar, I am a weather watcher. I want to know what's coming because that allows me to do my planning for my planting. And so when I look at what we're looking at for May, they're talking that it's going to be below average on average temperatures and our, and, um, and our precipitation is going to be kind of dry. Now, today, I would say that's getting kind of close to it. But when we look at where they're going for the summer, we are looking like it's going to be a hot summer. And then at least for Ohio, on the southern half of Ohio, a slighter, higher than normal chance of extra precipitation. And um, that could be good. That could be bad. A lot of the summer veggies, they don't really like to be hot and humid. That predisposes them to fungal disease. So that's something to think about as you make your summer plan for your planting. All right, so I like to go into what can we do right this minute. If you are a seed starter and you have some grow lights inside, feel free to get started. I have uh, under lights right now. I have a bunch of lettuce. I'm going to turn my thing. Oh, no, I'm on blur. I have a bunch of lettuce and I got my tomato seedlings that are growing really, really well. Uh, I'm going to start fairly soon my cucurbits, my zucchinis. I'm going to start maybe some cucumbers, maybe some butternut squash. I have uh, some baby butternut seeds that I'm really anxious to try. And I'm not going to grow them for a long time. If you take a look at the picture on the bottom, that's what happens when you start your cucurbits indoors. That first leaf uh, pair comes out of true leaves and they look really cute like little mouse ears. And then the next one comes out and it's kind of bigger. And then they start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually they're as big as a, as a dessert plate and they take up all the space under my lights. But I have found that with the soil that I have in my community garden, it can really get compacted and it can dry out heavy clay. I do have some germination concerns. So I do like to start um, certain plants inside and believe it or not, even a giant seeded family of veggies like the cucurbits will have trouble germinating in, in where I grow. When I am talking about soil temperatures too, I just want to mention that you really do have differences depending on where you're at. Outside of 270 is going to be totally different than inside of 270. In the ground at Waterman Farm is going to be different than even as a, a raised bed at Waterman Farm. I live on the top of a hill. My community garden is at the bottom of a hill frost and cold air flows right down that hill. It might be 40 degrees at my house and it might be 33 and frosty down at the garden. So that's why I recommend take your soil thermometer, get the reading where you are so you know what's going on in your micro environment. Okay, let's go into veggie families for a second because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the major veggie families that we talk about for summer planting, talk a little bit about care, talk a little bit about fertilization strategies for them, talk a little bit about the pests, the weeds and disease that we have, because quite honestly, when I grow year round and I grow and harvest every single month of the year outdoors, something 
one of the reasons I really do like the cooler weather is a lot of the pests and the disease go away. And when we talk about our summer veggies, that's when the bugs are out there. That's when the weeds are out there. That is when the disease is out there. And so we need to have that in our mind because we want to scout for it. We want to prepare for it. We want to find the problem before it becomes a major problem. And then when I take a look at vegetable families, and we touched on this in our first webinar, we crop rotate according to vegetable families. And so when you look at the Solanaceae family that we're going to talk about in a minute, that's our tomatoes and our peppers and our eggplant and potatoes. They are all cousins. But what that means for veggie families is cousins are similarly impacted by pests, weeds, and disease. And when we crop rotate, which means we plant vegetable families ideally in a different part of the garden or in a different raised bed, moving them about every three years, we do that because if we plant them over and over in the same spot, we select for pest, weeds, and disease. And by doing crop rotation, you are using one of the best tools in the toolbox of a grower in order to try to minimize some of the negative impacts that we have. And when we talk about the problem families, the ones that really get hit by stuff that happens in the garden, Solanaceae, tomato family, huge, brassicas, huge, and then the cucurbits, huge. Those are the three most impacted, and I'm going to spend a little more time on those today. So let's jump right into Solanaceae, the tomato family, the um, tomato, pepper, eggplant, potatoes, the nightshades. Half of them are delicious vegetables. The other half are deadly poisons. These are plants that are laterally rooted. So keep in mind that if you plant these in a single row and you walk down that row, you could be compressing right on the roots of this family of plants. And that's important to note because plants uptake their nutrients, their water, their oxygen through their roots. And a dynamic large root volume is a nice thing to have if you want a healthy harvest and a healthy plant. And compaction of soil is a huge negative for allowing that dynamic root volume to grow. So that's why I grow in raised beds. But if you grow in rows, just keep in mind that you need to make sure that you allow a radius of, of walking so that you're not compacting these plants. And generally, these are also plants, and this is unusual amongst our veggies because most of them don't allow this, but they will interstitial root, meaning they root off the stem. So like you'll probably have seen where you can plant your tomatoes deeper in the ground. And I do that with mine as well. And that's because I will get extra root growth laterally where roots will grow right out of the stems that have been submerged in the soil. These are heavy feeders. Generally, my fertilization strategy for them is going to feed ideally according to a soil test with a decent enough fertilizer at the beginning. And then if I'm using a slow release granular, I understand that depending on what my soil fertility levels are, I may need to refertilize in about two or three months because that's how long they're labeled to fertilize in that space right off the label on the bag. And when is that happening in a tomato's life? That's when a tomato has been grown in the ground for two or three months. It's starting to get really big. It's starting to produce a ton of tomatoes. And that is not when you want a nutrient stress to hit those plants. Okay. Also note that Interestingly enough, now tomatoes fit just about any way that you could grow and in, in, in a lot of different styles of growth. There are dwarf varieties. There are varieties uh, optimized for containers. Then we talk about determinant varieties. Those grow and, and get to a certain size before they flush out large numbers of tomatoes. Then we talk about indeterminants, and they will vine and grow continuously throughout the year. So make sure that you are tailoring the variety to what you want to grow. And if you don't have any space in the ground, you want to grow tomatoes in containers, then I recommend getting a container variety and sizing that container appropriately, meaning you kind of want a big container, right? Because you want lots of tomatoes. And remember, plants take up their nutrients, their oxygen and their water through their roots. A big container allows a big root volume, which allows a healthy plant and a healthy harvest. Okay, so I like to grow indeterminate tomatoes in my community garden. I grow them in raised beds. You can see that right now. I have two different kind of mulch that I'm using. I have plastic culture mulch in the pathways for weed control. And then I have a very deep batch of organic mulch. I prefer hay. Straw would work just fine as well. I use that for multiple reasons. One is 
I want a deep mulch because I don't want to have to water all the time. And I want to mitigate the a number of sort of spikes of dry soil, wet soil, dry soil, wet soil. So mulch will even out the evaporative loss and then mulch will keep the soil at the temperature I like closer to that 70 degrees when I planted. That will allow the tomato to be able to utilize the moisture that is in the soil. Plus, mulch is a great barrier to try to prevent the rapid spread, not complete spread, but the rapid spread of fungal disease because tomatoes are fungal magnets, all of the various early blights and septoria leaf spots and things that, that kill tomatoes. Generally, they splash up from fungal spores in the soil onto the lower leaves, and then they march up the uh, plant over time. And I'm going to show you a picture of that. I uh, like to basically have a goal of I want to get as many tomatoes as I possibly can and I try to keep my tomatoes alive until frost so that they die from frost and not from blight and then I go tall on mine because I'm growing indeterminates in full sun and I'm matching the fertility to them they can get 10 feet tall over the course of the growing season and while I can't reach 10 feet tall I can reach eight feet tall so I go with eight foot trellis and then we have a ton of different ways that we can trellis our tomatoes. But what I tell folks is if you're growing indeterminates, cherry tomatoes, heirlooms, a lot of those plants, realize that over time they're going to get huge. And if you're growing them in those tiny little tomato cages that are only like three feet tall, uh, you're not providing the support that they need. And so on mine, I like to prune to a double liter. If I was going to do just like a single one um, tied onto, say, an eight foot post, I would prune to a single liter. And then I prune aggressively over time to promote airflow. These are my tomatoes. They're in harvest. This is probably August, quite honestly. These are probably eight foot tall tomatoes in August. And I have been pruning as I harvest. Once I harvest something, I prune everything out from under it. But you can see my mulch is doing a good job at mitigating uh, a bunch of weeds. And what you're looking at here that looks kind of like fabric was before I started to put a seven foot tall deer fence around my garden, I had to wrap it in, in netting or else the deer would literally go into my garden and eat all of my tomatoes, even the green ones. I've seen them do it. Okay, so my favorite vegetable to grow is onions. I like to go into schools and I like to work with kiddos and ask them what they like to grow. And then when it gets to me and I say, my name's Tim and my favorite veggie's onions. And they're all like, oh, that's so gross. But I love onions and I grow them all year round. So right now, depending on where you're at, is onion planting time, although not onion seed planting time. We're a little bit too late for that unless you're growing like a green onion. That's one of my favorite things about onions is there's so many forms of them that you can grow them and harvest them deep into the winter, super early in spring. They store, they eat fresh. Uh, I just love them. I cook with them. I eat them. Uh, but here in Ohio, we want to maximize our successful onion harvest by planting long day onions. Okay, so what I mean by that is onion variety come in long day, short day, or day neutral. And what that means is, depending on your daylight and how daylight is increasing, that is going to induce onions to start to bulb up, right? And I'm talking about like the onions we want to slice and put on a, a cheeseburger onion. In Ohio, we have days that are now increasing in the amount of daylight. And we're in the northern hemisphere, so we grow long day onions, right? Think Walla Walla variety onions. That's Walla Walla, Washington. For anybody on the call here who is in a southern state, you would go with a short day onion, and that's because your days are not going to get as much daylight as we have in the northern hemisphere over time. And think Vidalia onions, okay? That is Vidalia, Georgia. If you get a day neutral, then they have been developed that they are going to go into size regardless of where you grow them. The key thing is you have to check because it doesn't always say on that box. You know, when we plant right now, we're going to plant either in sets, which are like mini bulbs, or we're going to plant in transplants, which are basically uh, what look like kind of scrawny green onions that have a gum band around them that you can get in the store. Both of them work fine as long as you pick long day for your northern variety uh, or northern hemisphere, short day for your southern, or find your day neutral if you can't find those. If you plant a variety uh, in, in, in 
in a daylight time, like if I planted short day up here, you know, they're going to start growing as onions, but they're not going to bulb up to the size that I want. In fact, they might get stressed and they might bolt or throw up a seed head. And once they do that, really that seed head growing through the middle of your onion is hard like an iron bar. It really affects the flavor and the ability to eat that onion. So make good choices, people. All right, let's go into the brassicas giant family and you're thinking tim brassicas are a cool season veggie and actually brassicas are really interesting to me because they are grown all four seasons uh i grow them in spring summer fall and winter i grow them uh pretty much all year round and we have a bunch of them that we are going to either mature in the winter or we're going to mature in the summer or we're going to grow them clear through the summer when we think of this family what's also interesting is they come in so many forms we have brassicas that we harvest and eat the heads we eat the leaves we might eat the roots we might eat the stems in fact some of them we eat just about every part of those so i like to plant them uh and i like to do a good job of keeping brassicas in my crop rotation since I plant them all 12 months of the year. They have so many pests. They have a bunch of different disease on them. But one of the nice thing about them and one of the reasons that I will plant them throughout the cool weather is you don't have pollinator concerns. So if you're going to use some sort of pesticide and that's organic or non-organic, make sure you read, understand, and following the label, but realize that you're probably not going to have a bee label worry component on this because we eat our brassicas before the flowers emerge. So this is one where if you needed to do protection from, say, the bugs. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But take a look at this list. This is impressive in terms of the scope of them. We have a bunch of different head brassicas. Then we have a bunch of different greens. We have ones that form almost an above ground root. We have ones that form a below ground root. We have ones that grow um, and, and kind of like the heat. We have ones that grow and like the cold. This is a really interesting family of delicious and healthy veggies, and they should be in your summer rotation. Now, I will say for a number of these, while they will grow into the summer and while they can tolerate some heat, most of them would prefer to mature into cold weather. That makes them sweeter. Uh, that makes the flavor a, a lot richer and avoids some of the bitterness that you can actually have with brassicas maturing into the heat. All right, but they have a lot of pests. And here is uh, enemy number one. That would be the um, cabbage white butterfly, which is the most common butterfly in Ohio. It is an invasive species. And take a look at this little tiny egg. I just did a program the other day and right on cue, mama butterfly showed up and laid an egg on kale. This is her little egg, that tiny little dot. She lays one egg per plant because her baby is going to grow into a big fat caterpillar and it is going to munch a bunch of your food and she only wants one baby per plant because she doesn't want any competition for her kiddos to have to find food but that is a picture I watched one of these um, I watched one of these butterflies land on my broccoli and her little ovipositor stuck that egg on there and I pulled it in and got a magnifying lens to take this picture there's a penny look at that tiny little thing but this caterpillar can grow a couple inches long and it is shocking how big they can get and how much food they can eat. Now you have lots of different choices for control that I used to, before I really got a good strategy, I was just off of broccoli because there's just nothing grosser than harvesting a head of broccoli and you put it like in water uh, to, to steam it or boil it and you just have a bunch of worms float to the top. But now we have great different uh, control methods, uh, organic with short post-harvest intervals or Honestly, since you don't have pollinator concerns, you can buy insect netting and you get that over and those insect nettings are permeable to light water and oxygen. So when it rains, it waters those and, and that can be a very effective deterrent for this pest. Okay, the cucurbits are a summer crop and I would say that this is um, this is the plant family that I get some of the most uh, questions about because there are so many bugs that affect this giant and ancient family. The problem is this is 
most of the time, almost always a pollinator dependent family, right? We're going to show male and we're going to show female flowers. So we do have pollinator concerns. And a lot of the bugs that pester this family are tough. They are hard to kill and they are prolific breeders and they will hide from you and they can cause lots of damage. So we generally have to mind our pollinators. Now you can bird net it and you can hand pollinate because they have very easily identifiable male and female flowers. One of the things that I found as I was doing my research years ago is I would see where it says to plant in hills. And I couldn't really figure out why they would say plant in hills because these are generally very thirsty crops. They like to have a lot of water. So a hill is going to shed water away from the root zone. And these, um, uh, I didn't really see where there was a, a benefit of that. In fact, I don't plant in hills. I literally plant mine in a tiny depression in the ground, almost like a tiny saucer, about an inch deep. And the reason I do that is I want to keep moisture in where the seeds are so we get good germination. And I will be applying some level of a pesticide to this plant that is going to be protective for cucumber beetles that's going to be protective for squash vine borers i'm going to use that pesticide i'll rotate uh, any several different pesticides i'm going to go uh but but what i do is i'm going to apply them around the base of the stem and i want to keep that pesticide close to that stem i don't want to put it around that on top of a hill and have water just just basically wick my pesticide away and put it in other places in my garden. I want to keep it right to that plant. I want to minimize my exposure and, and my pesticide uh, drift to other places. So not only do I not plant mine in hills, I actually plant them in a tiny little crater, uh, not like a big one, maybe an inch or so deep. And then one of the things that I highly recommend folks do, especially with your shorter maturing varieties, that's your cucumbers, your yellow squash, and your zucchini is plant it several times per year. I will plant mine, if I'm minding my calendar, three times. I will sow a sowing around June 1st, July 1st, and August 1st in different parts of my garden. I'm still trying to mind my crop rotation, but I have found that, uh, especially with my last planting, what I can do is I can start that later in the season and protect it with bird netting uh, and protect it with, with a, a mild amount of pesticide to the point where the pests go away, they're looking for their overwintered homes. And so generally, any more, my last planting in August is oftentimes my most prolific planting for harvest for the season, because that's when I'm trying to use my integrated pest management of understanding life cycles of the pest to plant later in the season to try to minimize the amount of pest exposure that I have. Okay, huge family, ancient family, Summer squash, winter squash. This has your pumpkins. This has your gourds. These were used as tools. Uh, this is all of your vining fruits as well. And so when we talk about, um, you know, the male and the female flowers, unless you get what's known as a gynecious and a parthena carpic variety, and actually that's what I grow indoors in my hydroponic unit. Those are the little cucumbers that you can buy at the store that are sold as little snackers in a bag. They don't require pollinators, and so they're ideal for greenhouse growing, but most of the time outside we're growing ones that would have a male and female flower. The male flower is just a stem and a flower. Okay. The female flower has a little miniaturized version of the fruit, and when they're pollinated, basically a pollinator goes into the male, picks up a bunch of pollen, goes into the female, and then pollinates that. And so this is what an immature one looks like, but when we take a look at a larger plant later in the season, this is a female, this is a female, they are um, going to get pollinated by the male. Here's just a male flower right here, stem flower about ready to open. And when we take a look at this picture, uh, one of the things to stress is this picture was taken in probably October, meaning that I uh, am getting good production. I am not seeing a bunch of pest damage. And this is a use of life cycle understanding for the major pests. And they have major pests, okay? Two of the ones that I get lots of calls about 
that can devastate your cucurbits in a hot minute are the cucumber beetles. There are spotted varieties and striped varieties. And believe it or not, even though they're the same color and they are similar shaped and size, they are as closely genetically related as cats and dogs. They also feed on the same plant and they vector a disease um, that is a, causes a bacterial wilt and that can cause damage to your plants um, right when they're in heavy harvest and it can do that damage really, really fast. That bacterial wilt can overwhelm a plant in just a few days. And so when we talk about how do we protect against these, we have a few tools in our toolbox, but not as many as I would like because we do have to mind with any pesticide application, the label, if it has a B label on there, and that could be organic or non-organic, to make sure that we are protecting our pollinators. So one strategy that I have is I start my seedlings indoors so that I put out transplants, which are a little tougher than starting a baby seedling in the ground. And then I'll use a mild amount of pesticide. I like to put a insect netting over my plants right away. And I have to watch those plants pretty carefully because I will have to remove it at some point. What I do is I watch for the emergence of the male flowers because generally the habit of these plants is put a couple few male flowers out to attract the pollinators before the female flowers come out. So the pollinators are used to coming to the plants to feed. Once I start seeing female flowers, I need to get that netting off. And then I start scouting very carefully to see my pressure uh, from my cucumber beetles or the squash bugs or brown marmorated stink bugs. Um, but that netting gives me a little bit of protection from squash vine bore and it gives me some protection against the other bugs until they start to get there. And, and then you really have to watch your scouting. Now, one of the things that we have in our gardens is for every bad bug that is out there, there is a good bug that wants to eat the bad bug for food. And so one of the predators of cucumber beetles is wolf spiders. So if you really have a horrible problem with cucumber beetles, then what you can do is just get yourself a mess of wolf spiders and sprinkle them all over your zucchini patch and then problem solved. If you don't want to do that, there's other things that you can do. Um, there are some sprays that are sort of mechanical barriers to prevent feeding. Uh, but one of the things that I really like to do for my cucurbit pests is I scout. So I would say this is number two on my public enemy list for the um, cucurbits. And this is the squash bug. OK, so on the bottom left corner is Mama Squash Bug and she lays eggs and she lays some really pretty eggs. They bronze and, and she lays them sort of like in a grid. When she lays them, they're white like a chicken egg and then they turn bronze shortly over time. She can lay them on the top. She very commonly lays them underside of a cucurbit leaf. And then after a few days, they hatch into larval forms and then they mature through nymphal instars until they turn into um, more squash bugs. And I find that where uh, where these can get out of control is if I'm not scouting and I don't catch these egg masses, she'll lay a much bigger egg mass than this. And she'll, she might lay several egg masses all over plants. And so what I do is I am scouting. Uh, I try to scout my cucurbit patch, checking top and bottom leaves pretty much every day or every other day. And when I see an egg mass cluster, I put my thumb on it and I literally rip that whole part of the leaf off. I don't scrape them off uh, because then they would just fall into where the plant is and potentially hatch and crawl back on there. I try to get them out of my garden. And if I can do really good scouting, I have found that that is a pretty good way to keep this pest under control, um, at least early on in the season. And, you know, as a cultural IPM thing, it has no pesticide residue uh, and it feels good to get them out of there, too. OK, let's move on to another veggie that, again, when we see some of these families, we can see that you can grow them in spring, summer, fall. And, and believe it or not, uh, some of the cover crop varieties we can grow all the way over winter. But our legumes are a favorite right now growing in my garden. You guys, we talked about in the living your best spring garden life, getting my peas in the ground. And I have peas that are growing really, really well. And I keep them protected so that the deer don't eat them because they would just graze them all to the ground instantaneously because peas are legumes, which means not only would they get carbs from eating them, 
but they would also get protein. And if you've ever noticed that when wildlife hits your garden and eats your stuff, they go for the healthiest stuff first. They don't go and eat just the lettuce. They're going to go right and eat a head of cabbage or they're going to eat all your peas because they are smart that way. They know you're growing delicious veggies and they know which ones are healthy and they eat those first. So when we're talking about living our best summer garden life, I need my soil to go about five degrees warmer, and then I'm going to put the first planting of bush beans in the ground. I like to grow bush beans. I like to grow pole beans. I like to grow those long asparagus beans. I grow peas. I like to grow a whole bunch of legumes because... I can fit those into nice little windows of planting and because they're nitrogen fixers, they are they're going to set nitrogen back into the soil. So when I plant my green beans, I go for fast maturing bush varieties. And just like I would for my zucchini, they're going to get three plantings. They're going to go. Um, in fact, I might even go four plantings, quite honestly. I want to have them in a rotation of a harvest because I like to eat green beans and I want a green bean harvest over a long time period, not just one big pile of green beans for about two weeks. And so um, when I'm talking about the nitrogen fixing, though, I get lots of questions about that. So I made a slide to, to talk a little bit about when I talk about a legume fixing nitrogen, because they don't actually fix the nitrogen. They are in a beneficial relationship with rhizobia bacteria, where the bacteria fix the nitrogen from the atmosphere and the atmosphere is in the soil, right? They uptake their nutrients and their oxygen and stuff through the soil. And then the bacteria get carbs from the plant. It is important to note that, you know, if you are a farmer and you're planting a large field of soybeans or some other thing, you actually will inoculate and put a bunch of bacteria in because you want a heavy amount of nitrogen fixing to go on. And in my community garden, it's been around since the 1940s. We have rhizobia for about every species you can think of because there's not one rhizobia species that fixes nitrogen for all the legumes. Generally, each species of legume requires its own symbiotic rhizobia species. So if you've been growing in the same space for a while, you probably have a population in there ready to grow. But if you had a very um, brand new growth, you just made a raised bed and you just filled it with new soil, you might might even consider thinking about getting an inoculant because you can purchase that from a lot of seed companies just to get a jump start and maximize your harvest when you plant. All right, so I did something this year that I vowed I would not do and I planted sweet corn. And the reason I planted sweet corn, I love sweet corn, but here's the problem. Sweet corn for me is a bunch of work, but you get a tremendous harvest, but in my garden with, with no fences and a lot of traffic, what I find is I don't really get a lot of sweet corn. Somebody or something else gets a lot of sweet corn. So I'm trying to grow it in my work garden this year and we'll see what happens. Um, I grow sweet corn about once every 10 years and that's because it takes me nine years to forget how much I hate trying to grow sweet corn. But I was gifted a bunch of seed this year from a super sweet variety that I'm really excited to try. And I have an event later in the summer that I would like some sweet corn. And so I'm going to give it a, a, a whirl. And um, and what I like to joke when people, because people ask me all the time, how do I know when it's ready? And uh, it's a it's a little bit of an art, a little bit of science, but basically you can test a kernel. And if it is, uh, if it is, you know, really watery, uh, it, it's probably not ready. If it's that milky, it's probably ready. And if it's just doughy, then you have field corn at that point. But if you want to wait, when the raccoons have uh, harvested all of your sweet corn overnight, when you thought you were going to get them the next day, then you knew that the best day to harvest your sweet corn was yesterday. All right. Now, I had stressed this before, but I'm going to reinforce this because I like to grow for production. I like to take advantage of the fact that where I am in Ohio, I can grow all 12 months of the year. I can harvest fresh produce that I grow outside every single month of the year. We get those time windows. We're going to have a few nice days in January. We are going to have a bunch of nice weather. This February, we had beautiful weather. We actually had nicer weather in February here than we had in March, quite honestly. I had planted stuff in January out under row cover and harvested it in February and planted stuff in February and harvested in March. But in order to do that, you have to plant stuff all the time, which is easy to do. Because if you look in that 
packet of green beans or lettuce or carrots or radishes, there's about a billion seeds in there. And if you're like me, if you don't plant them all, then you just save that packet of seed until those seeds are so old that they're not going to germinate at all. So plant your seeds, plant rotations, make sure that you have a stream of harvest. I like to say that seeds are cheap, vegetables cost money. So get them in the ground. I sequential plant lettuce, carrots, radish. I've already been harvesting radish and I've already done a second planting of radish seeds. Uh, and like I said, my green beans and my cukes will probably get three times. And when I grow basil, I plant basil at least three times a year. Don't try to rescue your basil when it's going to seed and it's putting those white flowers up and you're trying to chop it with your scissors, trying to slow it down. It doesn't want to slow down. It's an annual. It's just trying to complete its life cycle. Plant more. You have more seeds in that packet. Okay. Weed control. Summer garden is where there's weeds. I just had a meeting with a bunch of school teachers. We do school gardening things outside. They're getting ready to put their gardens to bed. And, and my guidance for them was pull every plant, enjoy your last harvest with your kiddos. And then they're going to put black plastic tarp over their raised bed and weigh it down with rocks. And then that will keep weeds from germinating. So when they come back in the fall, they can pull the tarp, they can refresh the soil and they can plant right away without having that problem. But for the summer garden life, if you wanna live your best summer garden life, make a plan for your weeds. And basically what that is, is for your annuals, don't let them go to seed. For your perennials, don't let them go to seed either. You don't want more baby weeds out there. Keep them mowed, keep them knocked down. Believe it or not, this is a picture from my garden, what it looks like if you have one patch that you have not done anything with. This is about six weeks of growth after they've rototilled in the spring and we got a good rain. That is what my garden looks like because it has been growing pests, weeds, and disease since the 1940s. If you went through this picture, you would find about every single problem garden weed that you could think of. And this wasn't my plot, this was my neighbor's, which means it now became my problem. But I'm looking at this and I'm seeing, we're starting to get some flower heads here. This all needs knocked down, okay? All of that would be mowed, weed whacked, step on it. However you wanna do it is fine by me, but for your weed control, the key is don't let it go to seed. That will prevent annuals um, from completing their life cycle and that will weaken perennials over time. Okay, and then we like to talk about good bug versus bad bug. Remember I showed you the picture of the super happy wolf spider. When we are identifying our bugs in the garden, we need to make sure that they are good or they're bad, right? When I go to schools and I'm working with the kiddos and we're outside and we're digging in the dirt and then one of them always goes, I found a bug, Tim. And then I'm like, all right, guys, we found a bug. What are we going to do with it? And they're like, we need to kill it. And I'm like, hold on, guys. Let's uh, talk about this first because like I said, for every bad bug that is eating your stuff, there's a good bug that is your friend that wants to eat that bug. So like when we look at this picture on the left, we have um, a predator of tomatoes and, and they don't normally pose this way on a fence post. I put that uh, hornworm there. The um, one on the right has a bunch of egg cases on it from a beneficial wasp. And so this is one that you kill. This is one that you leave alone because when these eggs hatch, the little babies are going to drill into this rascal. They're going to eat it from the inside out as they grow. And then they're going to fly out into your garden and kill more bad bugs. And so we need to make sure that we are practicing our good integrated pest management and identifying your bug. I get lots of questions that come to me and say, Tim, I need to know a good spray to kill bugs. And I say, what are we talking about here? We need to follow the label. We need to identify the bug. It might not be a bad bug. And then this is this was a great experience that I had. This was a farm tour that I did out in Madison County. And this was a farmer that had multiple acres in cherry tomato production that would sell them to grocery stores locally. And he had trained his dog, Reggie, who is a Labrador mix, to eat hornworms. So like if you look at this picture, you can see a tomato plant. And these guys will eat a shocking amount of your tomatoes. And so he had trained his dog to go through the garden. And when he found hornworms, worms, he would just eat them. And while as a veterinarian, I'm not sure I can recommend that, boy, it was a just a dynamite amount of integrated pest management. And look at that, no pesticide residue and no damage to that plant whatsoever. Good dog, Reg. Okay.
I'm going to go back to our soil temperature thing here because I like to talk about what can we do right now. And right now, not too, too much, quite honestly, but that's going to change really soon. This is our weather that we have going in uh, central Ohio here. And, you know, we're going to do like we normally do. We're going to kind of skip over spring and we're going to go jumping right into some of the hot weather, although this doesn't look too bad. I don't mind 70s. I like 60s better. That's just me. But we're going to have some warm ups. We have nights that don't look too bad. I am not seeing anything all the way past what would be considered our normal last frost date. Now that's normal. I've had frost as late as Memorial Day in, in my community garden. So make sure that you're checking your stuff there. But it looks like upcoming, we're going to have some really good warm up. I'm going to be tracking my temperatures in my soil. Right now, they're too cold for any of my summer veggies. But I'm hoping that with the warm weather that we're going to get in the next few days that I can not get my tomatoes in. It's way too early for that. Um, but I'm going to hope to target maybe some green bean planting for that first planting here. Maybe try to get some zucchini started under my lights and see where my soil temps are for maybe a transplant out there. And I will be continuing to grow my peppers and my tomatoes under my grow lights and in my eggplant as well until they're ready to go in. I'm not going to rush them. The, you get one try with those. And if you put them in too early and they get hit by frost, then it is me going to the nursery and spending money on buying new plants. So what can you plant now? Right now, basically, we're sticking to most of spring veggies. Our summer veggie is coming up. But if you have not yet had a chance to plant your second plantings of your lettuce and your radishes, go for it. You want to get some carrots and, and, and your onion sets to transplants in the ground. Same with your seed potatoes. I got a whole box of uh, seed potatoes. I need to plant those here this weekend. I'm kind of behind on some of my spring stuff. Your green onions, your beets, and your Swiss chard, go for it. Uh, second planting of beets can go down right now. My cabbage family are going to go in as transplants plants for broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. I would still find it perfectly fine to plant collard greens or mustard greens or kale from seed. Same with bok choy. I would also have no problem starting those indoors under my lights and putting them out as transplants. Okay, and so I showed you that picture when it was super cold and yucky in COVID world. And so this is Wallace Community Gardens in a much happier time. Uh, this is going in there in July and August. And that's the exact same pathway. You can see that there's a big sign. That was the rules and regulations that you had to follow in COVID to, to minimize um, potentially ex, you know, contracting disease from a fellow gardener. I was just so happy that food production and community gardens was de um, designated as essential. And so one of the interesting things about Wallace is you'll see all the sunflowers and all of those are weeds. Nobody plants those. They come up year after year. Giant sunflowers have naturalized themselves at Wallace as weeds. And most gardeners, myself included, will leave a few of them grow um, because they're just so striking. And people will come down there and take a bunch of pictures. Um, but, but summer's coming, gang. It might be cold and yucky outside, but hopefully this little short video gets you thinking about your best summer garden life that you have coming up here soon. On that note... I am going to let Angie do a little housekeeping, and then you guys are going to throw your chat questions into the Q&A. I will go back and forth between the both, and we'll speed round through your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. I learned so much and had some good laughs along the way, too. I'm sure a couple of people were taken back by that big wolf spider picture, but I loved having the up close. Um, everyone, this has been such a great webinar. Go ahead and put your uh, information, uh, your questions you have into the Q&A feature, um, or you can raise your hand and I might be able to have you ask it live. I've never tried that before, but we might be able to do that if you're feeling so bold. And everyone will be able to get a recording of this uh, one day after the um the webinar ends. And if you have family and friends that are also looking to get great information, let's just put um, our next webinar um, in the chat so everyone can register for that. And that's living your best garden in the fall. And Tim, you are inspiring us. You're harvesting all the time. And one of the things that I really love that you kept reminding us is that we don't just want one big harvest during one time to keep stratifying when you're planting those different seeds and getting your your plants into the ground so you actually have a prolonged where it's not 
all I can eat is peppers this week. You know, you can have them for a couple of months. So I really appreciated that. And I think our first question comes from an anonymous attendee. So can yeah. you... I'm going to jump right in and, and go through those. So Anonymous Sandy says, can you talk about how to plant Pelargonium graviolens and what season it's best to grow in? Any tips? So I'm going to give a general tip because I will first off say I am not a flower expert on that geranium. But when you have questions about individual productions or individual species or unusual things, surfing the internet can be uh, a little bit dizzying in terms of the stuff that you would encounter. And the... Um, the, the key would be to add the word extension to the end of your search terms. And then we have uh, attendees from all over, probably not only the US, but potentially the world for this one. So that will give you not only background on the plant, but find the state that you're living in because we have a land grant university in all 50 or at least find a state that is close to what would be your your environment your temperature your habitat so i would look up pelargonium graviolens um, which is a type of geranium type in the word extension and that will get you a fact sheet that will dictate um, the the best season to grow in and, and tips for growing and the fertility recommendations for that not only for the plant species itself but potentially even for where you want to grow it because i know that is kind of a heat lover and that is going to be one that is going to have some some care instructions okay can you talk about mexican bean beetles grew beans without problems for years but then they devastated my beans for a couple of seasons but disappeared last year so i find very similar impacts on my beans from bean beetles they're not as reliable every year they're like a cucumber beetle they come and they go i also find that when I have my worst time with bean beetles, it is more in the heat of the summer. I personally have less impact from it from my first planting or from my last planting. And so that is one of the reason, quite honestly, that I want to get some in the ground here soon. And I might even use row cover to uh, speed the germination and the growth because I want to have a harvest out of there before uh, the bean beetles come in. And then I um, will plant another batch close to uh, first week of August, and that will try to get a harvest at the end. What you could do for uh, bean beetles is you could plant some and then put insect barrier and wait until you get flower production to get uh, your insect barrier off. And if you wanted to do pesticide, then make sure you follow the label for pesticide application so that it is labeled for bean beetles and you have any mindfulness about the bee label once they come into flowering. All right. Our and our neighbors' backyards extend about two acres each of natural preserve. Okay, so what would you recommend? Nuisance wildlife, um, the bane of my gardening existence. I garden also surrounded by a natural area. My garden is a public park. I've seen seven deer at one time in my garden, including two bucks at one time. And so I showed you a picture of my tomatoes and I had bird netting on it. Bird netting can actually be fairly effective at protection from about anything that isn't a groundhog, I will say that now I hate to say I erect a temporary seven foot deer fence around my 30 by 40 plot and then disassemble it at the end of each year. Um, I put the posts in just the other day because I have found at least in the urban environments that fencing is your best bet. You can use repellents. They can be effective depending on how much rainfall you get and if you rotate them and if you're mindful about them. Um, I've seen some deterrents. I've used a deterrent that hooked up to my hose that had a battery motion sensor on it that sprayed water. But what I found is the nuisance wildlife, once they found it was water and they weren't startled, it kept them away a little bit, but they would actually eat right where the um, stuff came up. And so fence is my favorite. If you use repellents, they um, they have their pros and their cons. And Chuck said the white things on hormones are cocoons, not eggs. The eggs were laid earlier. The larvae fed inside the caterpillar. And now they're pupating. The insides of the caterpillar are messed up enough that it will soon die. Thanks, Chuck. That is uh, appropriately gruesome. And that is great uh, information for everybody. Um, that is a bunch of new found friends ready to hatch and head into the garden.
So anonymous attendee says, I hate killing things if possible, and I'm assuming that birds or other creatures might eat non-beneficial insects such as hornworms. Um, so can I remove the non-beneficial insects from the vegetables and relocate them to other areas of the yard like the grass trees, or they just return immediately to the vegetables? So they would probably die if you removed them. You know, if you pull off a hornworm and take it from its tomato and take it somewhere else, or if you pulled off the um, the imported cabbage worm from which is the larval form for the cabbage white butterfly and removed it, they would die because you've taken them from their food source. They that is their forage food, and so. Um, you can remove them and relocate them. They aren't really going to run back to the tomatoes because they're just not fast runners that way, but they still will die simply because they would then starve because they would not have the food. If they had eaten enough to mature, then they would likely go through their maturation cycle and then return back to the plants again. Okay, Elsie says, what are some beneficial insects for the garden? Are they something we can buy and add to our gardens? And so, uh, and then you said, what flowers are good partners to plant with vegetables? So I'm gonna answer them all as sort of a cluster because they go together. There are tons of beneficial insects for the gardens. Um, think of lacewings, think of uh, ladybugs. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of them and what, your you know your thought about what flowers are good partner plant partners to plant with vegetables in my garden uh, we plant a whole bunch of annuals i love zinnias they're pollinator attractors um, a lot of folks will plant marigolds they they have somewhat of a reputation for you know being uh, companion plants and providing some beneficial stuff i think their probably best use in the garden is uh, to create some biodiversity in the garden so in my garden i plant a bunch of cut flowers and i plant a bunch of um, uh, easy care sun and summer loving annuals because that's the season I get in my community garden. Other really great uh, flowers to plant with vegetables are, and I'm going to say flowers, but I'm going to say herbs because most herbs have really awesome beneficial and pollinator attracting flowers. Uh, you'll be shocked at how beautiful a sage flower is. My sage is going, uh, is, is putting flowers out right now. Um, a lot of herbs are great companions with vegetables because they provide alternate habitat for beneficials. They also provide a forage food for some beneficials and they have great flowers for beneficials. And in terms of buying them, you actually can. You can buy um, ladybugs and you can release them into your garden. When we talk about like a praying mantis, a praying mantis is a what I would call a generalist. Um, they're sort of like spiders in that they will feed on lots of things, but I've seen research that indicates that most of the time they um, eat more bad bugs than good bugs. You can actually buy cocoons of praying mantises. And if you've ever seen a praying mantis cocoon, when they start streaming out, they are miniature praying mantises that are like a couple millimeters. It's like a little army coming out. It's worth just watching that process to buy one. But yes, you can purchase a whole bunch of stuff like that. Okay. And Ted asks, what do you think of neem oil and BT, um, bacillus, bacillus thuringiensis for pest control and tomatoes, broccoli, and cukes? Uh, they're in my rotation, quite honestly. I try to rotate my pesticides so that I do not uh, get, or I can't say do not, but but minimize um, my, uh, my pesticide resistance issues. And what I would say is the key thing for safe and effective pesticide use is to make sure that you read and understand and follow the label because it is going to tell you on that label if that pesticide is applicable and will actually be effective for the pest. And then it also tells you what PPE you should be wearing to minimize any potential exposure risks that you would have. But then as important is it's going to give you what's known as the post-harvest interval, meaning how long after you've applied the pesticide before you can safely consume the food, and then it will tell you how many times 
per season or per year or per month or whatever, you can apply it because a lot of folks will just hose them down like every day. And quite honestly, most pesticides uh, have lots of, uh, uh, lots of rules and regulations. And when I say rules and regulations, believe it or not, it is a violation of federal law to use a pesticide in a manner that is um, uh, not according to its label. So do I have a suggestion for control of basil, downy, mildew? Um, boy, a downy and basil can be devastating. Uh, they're starting to come out with resistant varieties. I would say do not grow basil uh, in a spot where that you would have that problem in that space. Um, I like to crop rotate my basil and I like to um, grow multiple uh, sowings of basil that way. And then watch how you irrigate it so that you don't have a, a you know, sort of a humid environment that would predispose for fungal disease disease. And then, hey, Sue Simon, do I amend my soil? I amend my soil all the time. I harvest 12 months of year, which means I need to address my fertility 12 months of the year. When I pull a plant out, I know that I just pulled out nutrients from that soil and I'm going to eat them, which means if I want to continue harvesting at a very high level, I need to make sure that part of my plan is to amend my soil. I'm a composter. I put compost when I plant in the hole for transplants. I mulch around my plants with compost. Um, I use compost in my containers to top off the containers every year. And then I soil test every three years, trying to maintain my fertility at high levels. And so uh, Abby has slugs help. So Abby, slugs right now are uh, the predominant pest in my garden. I am seeing a lot of cabbage white butterfly. I recommend for slug control that you would source a product that has an active ingredient of iron phosphate. OK, it comes under some funny product names like Sluggo or Escargo, but iron phosphate is uh, effective for slug control. And then it breaks down into iron and phosphorus, which are two nutrients that are needed for plant growth. And then Abby has good recommendations. Make sure they're not non-native species of praying mantids if you buy them. I highly recommend, yes, that you, you, you do your due diligence on your source. Oof, good questions, Ooh. gang. I know we brought it home. 731. That's amazing. You you got right through those questions. There were some really good ones. Definitely extra questions that I had too. So um, I'll remember one thing. If I wake up and all the raccoons have eaten my corn, yesterday was the best day to have harvested it. I think it's so great that we were all together today, friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're looking forward to our fall series. And if you will get a, a copy of this recording or a, at least a link to the folder for it um, within uh, 24 hours. So you can expect that tomorrow evening if you couldn't take down notes as quick as we could answer them. Thanks again to Dr. Tim for joining us, um, to Liz for helping co-host today. I really appreciate everyone's time. Have a great rest of your evening and live your best garden. <laughs>